I am taking all the this golden opportunity to ask you the question which bothers me at times is about the world called democracy. What is democracy and what should be the relationship between the leaders and the people, the government and the people? And in growing de democracy, who, who gets corrupt first? The leader or the people? That's my question. <laughs> See, the, in Tamil, the word for democracy is jananayakam. That means people are the leaders. That the means people for there is no them. leader and there are no people. People are the leaders, that's what democracy means. Unfortunately, people have forgotten yes. that they are the leaders. I hear even today morning or yesterday evening I was being interviewed, today morning I was being interviewed by a journalist in Lucknow. So, he said, these politicians, I said, there are no politicians, they didn't fall from the sky. They're just you and me, somebody who is willing to do the dirty job for you. Yes. What you think is dirty and you don't want you, yourself or your children to get into, somebody got into it for you. <laughs> yes. And once you get there, the entire game is such that it just dirties your hands, you can't help it. It's become like that, the system. So in democracy, there is no leader and people, it's people and people. But obviously there are leaders and there are people today. That is because we have allowed it. Otherwise, every five years, you could stand up and become a leader, that's how it should be. We have not kept it more mob mob uh, mobile enough because we have this tendency of giving responsibility to somebody and, and forget, forget about it. for five years. Only when something goes wrong, we will scream. Otherwise, we don't care a damn. When it is essentially… If you… if you are making a movie or somebody is running a business, not after something goes wrong, you'll attend to it as a director. You are on it every moment yes. to see it goes right. Yes, sir. So I am saying, once you live in a democracy, you must be an active participant. It is not a spectator sport to sit back and forget about it and then cry when something goes wrong. I am telling you, even your home will not run right if you don't pay enough attention, forget about the nation. Yes or no? Even yes. your home, your own family will become corrupt if you're not paying attention to many things. Yes or no? You don't like it but it's true, isn't it? If you don't pay constant attention, even your home will go bad and corrupt. So when this is a thing, such a large nation, if everybody doesn't pay attention to what needs to happen, it will go bad. Then we cry, we have this problem. When small things go wrong, we have somebody here. When big things go wrong, we have somebody there <laughs> This guy is free, free. <laughs> he is never responsible for anything. <laughs> this has to change. Yes, but we are… See, the most beautiful thing about democracy is, power can change hands without blood flowing. Never before it's happened in human history. Whenever power changes, blood will flow. Now power can shift from one group of people to another group without blood spilling, which is a huge achievement. Yes. But we as individual need to understand that I am the part of the democracy and I'm equally responsible as my leaders are. See, I think one mistake we have done is in our education systems, in our homes, there is no awareness about this, that there are instruments in a democratic process through which all of us can participate in some way, on a daily basis if you wish. This has… this awareness has not been brought to people. They think if they cast vote once in ten years, because one election they'll miss, you know <laughs> Then the election day they went to Goa <laughs> One they will miss, one they will vote and they think they're very responsible citizens because they voted once in ten years. That's not how it works. 
you need an active participation. Then only democracy will work the way it has to work. Right now, our idea of leadership is, if we find a good leader, we will start worshipping them. A good leader does not need worship. What a leader needs, if somebody is… a competent leader comes at the top, what he needs is, he needs many layers of leadership so that he will find traction to what he wishes to do. But you will see if a good leader comes, he will spin on the spot because there is no traction down the line. Either there are worshipping people or those who are busy with their own stuff. So we need to understand, democracy means we have taken the nation into our hands. We need to make it happen. Somebody will guide it, somebody will make policies, somebody will take some decisions, but the nation is run by the people. If we don't get it, then we will always be just complaining, we will not have a great nation. If we want a great nation, we have to stand up and take charge of this country. Taking charge of the country does not mean usurping power tomorrow morning, no. Where we are, what roles we have to play, we should be doing our best. People are always talking about politicians being corrupt. But I'm asking you, if there is no policeman on the street, how many people will stop at the red light? I think about ten percent, I'm being generous, I know. <laughs> about ten percent. The rest, if you elect any one of them as the chief minister or the prime minister, what do you think they will do? Because they're lawbreakers anyway. I see, you know, normally I land in Coimbatore late in the night, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, one o'clock, whatever time, and I'm driving from the airport, red light, I stop. There is one little TVS moped guy who is parked behind me, king king, he will do. Then I don't… I don't go till the green light comes. He comes next to me and says like this <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> he thinks I am a fool, all right <laughs> Exactly, exactly <laughs> his, his thing is, no policeman, what are you doing here? Go! So if you make these people into… if you put these people into positions of power, what? People who are in positions of power are on spotlight, so everything that they do is seen. But corruption is all-pervading, isn't it? Within the house, between a girl, child and a boy, there is a distinction. This is corruption. Between a right hand and left hand, one is superior, one is inferior, this is corruption. Sure. So corruption is not just up there taking money or whatever. Corruption is on all levels, isn't it? There is no even-handedness about life. We have brought this to everything. This has to go means spiritual process is needed. needed. If I can share something, I think I must have shared already. I'll leave it. <laughs> spiritual process <laughs> is important. important. Because an inclusiveness is needed. You must transcend looking at things as superior and inferior, one is higher, one is lower, you learn to look at everything. This is one thing that happened to me very early. I realized I don't know anything, so I started paying attention to just about anything. One thing I discovered with people around me was, they could pay attention or they would pay attention only to those things that they thought is important. Rest of it, they learn to ignore. I couldn't do this because I couldn't decide what is important. I found the ant crawling on my… on the floor was far more important to me by… than my father who was call, asking me to do something at that moment, I'm saying. <laughs> yes, it was. It is so for your child also, isn't it so? Your child is looking at the ant. Is he not more… Is, does he not think the ant is more important than you at that moment? Yes, he does, because it's more interesting than you <laughs> It is <laughs> It is the finest piece of mechanics that you can find yes. on the planet. Yes. If you could build an automobile like an ant, whoa, it would just go anywhere, you know? Yes. So, I got into this mode of paying attention to just about anything. 
because it never occurred to me something is more important, something is less important. My father believed that he's a very… Uh, he's a disciplinarian, Tch, so he thought. <laughs> so evening, seven o'clock to nine o'clock in the evening, me and my siblings must study something, textbook. And he will be sitting there reading some magazine or newspaper so that we study. I have no issues about all that if I just open my book, I just open somewhere. I never had the habit, even today I don't have the habit, I always open somewhere. If I read one page, I know the author's mind through and through, so I don't read beyond that <laughs> So I open somewhere and on the page I find a small speck of something, you know, some flaw in the page. If I just look at it, it held my attention. Entire two hours I was like this, <laughs> looking at the spot. I never read a single word, nor did I look up anywhere. I just got absorbed into this little spot. There was enough in that little spot to keep me engaged for two hours. Why I am saying this is, this is the biggest mistake we are making with life. We are setting this up in our children's minds. This is God, this is devil, this is superior, this is inferior, this is mine, this is not mine. In this you are causing corruption. You are bringing corruption to the infant to recognize one thing as high, one thing as low, one thing as mine, one thing as not mine. Here, corruption has started. If you make this child that you brought him up like this into prime minister, of course he will be corrupt. Whatever, if you… by getting into a position of responsibility and power, it only gets magnified. Somebody doesn't just get corrupt the moment they get there. They've been corrupt all their life. They've been trained in corruption by their parents and their society. Now it got magnified because the opportunity is magnified. Yes. So corruption is not up there, corruption is everywhere. If you are concerned about corruption, just sit at home and see how many things are there in your life which you need to iron out. Yes or no? If you don't take this out, you have no right to complain about corruption because corruption is in your home, corruption is in your mind, corruption is all around you. It is just that those who are pos in positions of power, you expect them to be clean. I also do, but I don't believe that will happen unless down the line also, Look at we that. aspire for that in our lives because the kind of people we are, <coughs> that's the kind of leaders we elect, isn't it? We have some aspiration to change it, but we are not determined to change it. Something that is negative, something that is rotting in a society will not go away unless we are determined to change it, strong determination to change it. Otherwise, it will just go on. Rot is not something that you can simply get rid of because rot spreads by itself. It is cleanliness which is… which doesn't spread by itself. You have to do the cleaning, but rot spreads by itself. So corruption spreads by itself. If you want to bring cleanliness, you have to strive. First of all, bringing it into your life, otherwise it's not going to work. We'll only talk about it. Sadhguru, you're a master of knowledge and history, mythology, everything. and I feel that I'm a child of ancient India and I know Indian thousand years back, Indian hundred years back and Indian today. Thousand years ago, this is how they looked. <laughs> Not to the get up. <laughs> how I have changed, how I have changed from thousand to hundred to today and why I have changed. Is it a better or need to be better? What is the change you're asking? Yes. What is the change as an Indian? How much we have changed? When we talk about India, thousand means we are talking about recent times. Ancient times. Recent. Recent, thousand years, yeah. Lies <laughs> of four thousand to five thousand, yes. So, uh, 
India as a culture exists for over twelve, fifteen thousand years. At one time, we became a nation <clears throat> with enormous intellect, enormous capabilities, very crucible of science, mathematics, yes. astronomy. The greatest scientists in the world have acknowledged modern science could not have taken a single step without the mathematic that came from India. So there were tremendous minds that we evolved because we had what is called a Samskriti. Today we have Isha Samskriti school which is on these lines. Samskriti means… Sam means equanimous and exuberant. Kriti means way of doing it. That is getting life to a place where it is exuberant and equanimous. If you keep your life exuberant and equanimous, now this life will be full-fledged life. This is the aspiration of every life. Whether it is an earthworm or a bird or a tree, all of them are aspiring to become full-fledged life. So is a human being. Only thing is we know what is a full-fledged earthworm, we know what is a full-fledged bird, we know what is a full-fledged tree, but we do not know what is a full-fledged human being. No matter what you become, still you feel it's not enough. It doesn't matter what you have become. In somebody else's eyes you might have become big, but within you, you know this is not enough because what is human is a limitless possibility. Expansion. Because for every other creature, nature has two lines. Between these two lines they live and die. For a human being there is only bottom line, there is no top line. So most human beings are suffering their freedom. If you are suffering your bondage, understandable. But if you are suffering your freedom, that's a bad thing. But that's what is happening. Human problem is what to do with myself. Whatever you do, it's not enough. Whatever you do, it's not enough. If you had come like any other creature, your survival taken care of, everything is fine with you, isn't it? Eating, sleeping, reproduction, if it happens, you are fulfilled. Like but anyone. that is not the thing with human. When these things are in question, they are big. Once they happen, they are nothing. So this transition, what you're talking about, historical movement of uh, human beings in this country, there was a time when we hit a peak. But we became so absorbed in finer aspects of life what, that we did not have fighting men. Our biggest strength was we were placed in a geographical crucible where we were well protected. We call this Hindustan, not after a religion as people think it is today or some people think it's after a language, no. A land which lies between Himalayas and the Hindu Sagara or the Indian Ocean, this is Hindu. Why we worship these two geographical features is we knew our well-being comes from these two features. The Himalayan ranges and the Indian Ocean protected us so we could focus on the development of the human being. When every other society was constantly ravaged by external forces, we remained untouched for a long period of time. But when people came, they did not come as invaders. They just came in few hundreds, hundred, two hundred people. They were actually bandits. They wanted to rape, loot and run. But then they found People were so docile, people were deeply involved in spirituality, mathematics, music, astronomy. Somebody who is looking at the stars can't fight. Someone who is singing music cannot fight. Somebody who is, you know, counting numbers or doing mathematics cannot fight. They found this was such an easy land. Bandits became emperors. They stayed there only. They stayed back. Why run? Yes. <laughs> they decided to stay back and they became emperors. And these are not people with any administrative skills. They were barbarians. So they ruled that way. 
So immense suffering happened. But we had an evolved sense of intellect and philosophy and ideology through which we survived. It doesn't matter how you beat them, they didn't fight back but they survived. They not only survived, they kept their culture, they kept their Sanskriti, they kept their tradition to whatever extent they could and survived and survived and survived. After over a thousand years of invasions and all kinds of rules over us, still this is the only culture on the planet which still has a flavor of its indigenous origins. Everybody else is totally wiped out. But today, it has not been easy, it has not been the best of times. What was the greatest economic power on the planet just three hundred years ago? Uh, we became one of the poorest nations in a matter of two hundred fifty to three hundred years. I think at about two hundred seventy years, we became the poorest nation because everything was shipped out. But still we are coming back once again. We have an intellect, we need a determined leadership to wake us up a little bit, we are little yeah. sleepy you know, because for generations, ten, fifteen generations, our mothers have taught us never confront a problem on the street. If you see a problem, come home <laughs> Yes, this is what our mothers have taught us because this is the mentality of an occupied nation. Don't raise your head, put it down and come home because if you raise your head, you may lose it. But if we want to generate leaders in the nation, we need people who seek problems and confront problems on a daily basis. Yes. <clears throat> That's true. The moment you seek and confront a problem, half the nation resists. It doesn't matter what's the problem. See, everybody was talking about black money, all right? <laughs> it was one of the conversations always going on. Yeah. When they don't have money, they would say somebody else has black money. The money that I have is white, what you have must be black <laughs> This has been the mindset. Today's story. But when you try to take some action, just look at the voices all over. Is it the best action, is it the wrong action, that's not the point. We can debate it endlessly. But the thing is, it is some action in the direction. Yes. We talk about Sanskriti, you, you said about Sanskriti. And I wonder since my childhood that in my home and other places also, I always find pundits chanting Sanskrit mantra. We get married with the mantras around in Sanskrit, whether we understand them or not. You're not supposed to understand all no. that. That is what I was told <laughs> and everywhere I find mantras and pundits and all auspicious occasion or whatever the occasion is. And we respect somewhere, like the back of our mind, we respect our language, ancient language, Sanskrit. But when it comes to our kids to learn Sanskrit, we tell them, learn that language which gives you a job. This will not give you a job and we are very shy to allow them to learn Sanskrit. Why it is so, Sadhguru? See, this is as I said, we have experienced ten, twelve, almost fifteen generations of abject poverty. So when we are in such a state of poverty, our only concern is our children should somehow survive, somehow get one degree get a job. This used to be the mantra in sixties and seventies, get a government job somehow. Yes. Or become a doctor, that's the best thing, your life is made. Somebody else gets sick but your life is made <laughs> This is coming from a certain fear that yes. your children may not survive. If they don't pass this, this, this examination, they may end up on the street because that's all the options there were. The, it was not a false fear. If your ch child did not get educated, unless he was super talented with something, most probably he will end up as a street bum. That was a fact. But 
slowly things have changed, our economic situation has changed dramatically, whether we want to recognize it or not, in seventies how you were living and how you are living today, there is a phenomenal difference in the material wealth. So today our children have many more options, we can little go slow on this job-oriented education. Still, there is a large segment of India which still has to go that way, but we… those who are reasonably well-to-do can go little slow on their children. I created three different dimensions of education. One is rural education which is called as Isha Vidya. To bring awareness to this, tomorrow we are golfing at Wellington to bring awareness to rural education. This education is designed purely to get these children out of their economic and social pit they are in. This is from the age of six, they are learning English language. Within one year, they become fluent in English language and they start working on the computers. This English language and computer is their passport out of the village. This is the goal. This is run in a certain way. We have another school called Isha Home School, this is for the affluent. This is run in a completely different way, with an enormous inclusion of sport, art, theater, all kinds of music, every kind of thing that you can add to aesthetics to it. The school itself is created in a very aesthetic way. So the children experience a different dimension of life. And these children live in groups of twenty in a household with a dedicated couple who are parents for these children for the first five years and the next five years they'll have another set of parents, they move into a different house. These children grow up with enormous exposure to all kinds of talents. For example, now I made their eleventh and twelfth, which is two years, into three years. I said, in our school it's three years because we have invested so much on music, art, dance, theater, all these things, the moment they come to eleventh standard, many parents go marks mad. Suddenly marks, marks, marks will come, they want to drop the music, they want to drop every other art they've learned. So I said three years. So extra this one year, whatever they are good at, they will become much more proficient in that. If they are good musicians, they will go into that. If they are good in theatre, they'll go into art, we are exposing them to leadership, management, business, variety of things. But your children will get out of the school one year late. I think you can afford it because you are well-to-do, you have only one child or maybe two children, it's all right. Your child gets to work one year later, it's perfectly okay. Initially everybody thought it's crazy, now everybody wants to be there. Another dimension of education, here there is no formal education. There are only six things that they learn. They start with yoga, Kalari Paitu, which is the mother of all martial arts, classical music, classical dance, Sanskrit language, English language. This is all they study. First four years, these six subjects. After four years, they will drop any two of them and keep the four. And after another two and a half to three years' time, they'll drop two more and the next five years to six years, they will do only two subjects. They will become experts in that. You must come and see these children. You won't believe how they are. Yeah. They are incredible because this is focused towards building the human body and the human brain to its fullest. If you want something to perform, first thing is you must build a machine. You must build a machine to a higher level of capability, then only it will perform. Right now the biggest problem with uh, the modern world is we are too goal-oriented. We want to enhance our activity without enhancing who we are. This is why everybody is talking about stress. Whatever simple jobs they are doing, they are stressful because they have enhanced their activity without enhancing themselves. It's like you take your Maruti 800 on a racetrack, it will fall apart. Yes. Yes. It's not built for that, I'm saying. It's okay to go to your office, if you raise it, it'll… it'll break up. So similarly, if you want to enhance your activity, you don't worry about the activity. If you enhance the human being, he will perform the activity according to his capability. So this is focused on just developing the human being. These children are in another zone altogether. Yes. Fantastic. I… you won't believe it. I must tell you this. The first batch, I was to initiate them about five years ago, when they become fifteen years of age, 
they stay with us from the age of six to eighteen. When they become fifteen, three years they take brahmacharya. It is three year period they must take and at eighteen they must go off. It is not a compulsory beyond that, till that point because we want them to focus. When I had to initiate them at the age of fifteen, they go for a sixty days of silence. Oh. Okay, total silence. <coughs> now, <laughs> I have to initiate them, I want to see how the children are doing. About three, four days before the initiation, I go there to see them. Their schedule is from morning 3.30 to 8.30 in the evening, okay? In a day, at least six hours, they're sitting with their eyes closed, doing sadhana and all kinds of sadhana, at least about eleven to twelve hours of sadhana. In this, at least six hours, they're sitting with eyes closed. So I go there to see them at 3.30 in the morning. The first batch was only fourteen, today it's grown into big number. I go there and sit with them. <clears throat> Nearly half of them are girls and the rest are boys. I went and sat, I, I just looked at these children. They were literally glowing. I sat there and wept. Because I was not like this when I was fifteen, I know that very well. These children are literally glowing like lights. They're just sitting like this, unmoving. I just sat there for over two hours. They didn't move a bit. They just sat like… sat like stone. I just bowed down to them and came. That, this is fantastic <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> they are only fifteen, uh, fifteen-year-old children. That is ex exactly what I… when I said the right kind of education, this is a right kind yes, of education. Yes, but at the science. same time, as mm. I said, we are a huge population. Yes. If we want to improve it our education, grow. if we want to improve our education, if we want to improve nourishment, if we want to improve the traffic situation, if you want to improve anything in this country, we have to reduce our population, there is no other way. <laughs> <clears throat> One very interesting question in my mind I have been facing since my childhood. We are talking all this due respect to the belief of every guru and no, you don't have to respect my yes, belief because yes. I don't have any <laughs> When you were talking about the Adi Yoga, the great Lord Shiva, I remember my uh, mother used to go to Lord Shiva's temple and I used to accompany her. And she would tell me that it's Lord Shiva belongs to the three lokas, Dharti, Akash, Patal. So my father brought one globe the, showing the geography of the earth and I asked my mother, Ki is Lord Shiva, you are talking about the three worlds, I turned to the… I turned the globe, I said, does these Americans know Lord Shiva? So is Lord, Lord Shiva is territorial or the universal? That still question lies on me. <coughs> Let's understand this in the right context. The word Shiva, Shiva means that which is not. That which is, is physical creation. That which is not, is that which is not physical. That which is not, where can it be? In India or America? Or on this planet or in another galaxy, where can it be? It's everywhere. So, there is a dimensionless existence, so we call it appropriately Shiva, that means that which is not. Today modern scientists are saying, 
that nearly ninety-nine percent of the cosmos, cosmos is empty. But not that there is nothing, there is something, but it is not something. Because our idea of something is, we should be able to perceive through five senses. See, right now what you can see and what you cannot see is this. You can see my hand because it is stopping light. Anything that is not stopping light, you don't see, isn't it? Right now there is air here which you're breathing, which is most vital from your… for your existence, but you don't see it. You don't see the air unless you live in Delhi. That's the privilege of being in the capital city <laughs> Now, if you look up in the sky, you see the stars. But stars are a small happening. The real thing is the vast emptiness. So this we refer to as she for that which is not. Today modern scientists are saying, this vast space has a tremendous amount of energy, but it is not any of the energies that are measurable by us like electromagnetic uh, waves or uh, weak nuclear energy or strong nuclear energy or electrical systems or microwaves, none of these things. It is none of the measurable energies. But there is no denying it is tremendously powerful. So we said, so this is, uh, Shiva means that which is not and we said it is in the lap of Shiva that creation happens. At the same time, we called Adi Yogi also the Shiva because he perceived that which is not. You are who you are, people call you a director, a film producer, why? Because you perceived something. If you did not perceive that, they would not recognize you as that. So we recognized Adi Yogi as Shiva because he perceived that which is not. Because he perceived that, we called him also Shiva. Then maybe there are any number of people, at least in southern India, almost ninety percent of the males are named after Shiva. We called that man also Shiva because we know if he does the right things, he can also realize that he is Shiva. We named our dog also Shiva. Yes, because we know he is also made of the same stuff, but he does not know. But we must remind him by naming him Shiva. <laughs> we'll call the dog also Shiva, Shiva, no problem. In another country, in another religion, they would be very insulted if you named your dog by their god's name. But you'll see in the villages, dogs… In only in the cities they have this problem, all their dogs have English names. This is because this pet dog business came from the English people. <laughs> For us, dogs were there on the street and we never talk, thought of taking dogs and fondling them like this. <laughs> Only the English were doing it because they were away from home and they must have been feeling lonely. That's the reason. Now you see in India, every so-called middle-class family <laughs> <laughs> All their dogs have English names <laughs> So we will call the ultimate reality as Shiva, the one who realized that, the Adi Yogi as Shiva, one who did not realize that but has the possibility, we'll call him Shiva. We'll call the dog also Shiva because he is also made of the same stuff but he cannot know. But we want him to hear that sound. So every time we call him Shiva, 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 we hope that he will evolve one day. Thank you very much for uh, enlightening us about the real meaning of Shiva. So much. <coughs> and for those of you who do not know, now uh, on this 24th of February, we are unveiling uh, a face of Adi Yogi, which is 112 feet tall, because Adi Yogi. Adi Yogi offered one hundred and twelve ways in which a human being can realize 
his ultimate potential, hundred and twelve ways to do it. So as a way of honoring him and also to bring back this dimension that your well-being is not in looking up or looking down but looking inward. When we looked up in search of our well-being, we became hallucinatory. Then as modern societies, as science and technology came, we started looking out for our well-being. Once we started looking out for our well-being, in pursuit of human well-being, we have ripped the planet apart. True well-being will happen to a human being only when they turn inward. To bring this revolution back into the world, for the next generation of people particularly, we built this iconic face. And uh, a book is also ready now. The idea is to move people inward, yes. not up, not out, in. In is the only way out. <laughs> Sadhguru, I… Can we show the image Sadhguru. of Adi Yogi? Is it possible? Yes. On the screen? But I must say… This Sadhguru. is the largest face on the planet. Yes. I have gone through your book. It's an amazing, amazing book and so much enlightenment in it. And… but the best line which I found was that you said in your book, your joy, your miseries, your love, your agony, your bliss, all lie in your hand. Some are suffering their failures, some are suffering their consequences of their success. Some are suffering their limitation and some are suffering their freedom. What's the way out? <laughs> In is the way out. <laughs> <laughs> because all human experience is caused from within us. It's within us. Everything that ever happens to you, happens within you. What happens within you must happen your way, isn't it? Right now we are trying to fix the world to fix this one. Yes. It's not going to work like that. If you fix this one, then we can create a world the way we want it. But right now we think by fixing the world, this is going to be all right. It's not going to happen like that.